talked a lot so far about the biomedical insight and behavioral approaches to psychotherapy and treatment. However, now we're going to move into an area that's probably most common today in Canada, and that is the eclectic forms of treatment. So by eclectic, we're really meaning a combination, a combination to therapy. And what most graduate programs and PhD programs in Canada tend to focus on is this combo approach. The combo approach, however, is largely centered on one type of therapy we haven't talked about yet, and that is cognitive behavioral therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy itself is a combo approach. It's a combo approach of our cognitions, our thoughts, and behavioral therapy. It combines insight and behavioral therapy. In addition to that, we also see other types of things in there. We know that most CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy in Canada also includes a bit of the client-centered principles of authenticity and positive regard. And we also know there's other things in there like mindfulness, relaxation, helping to adjust with lifestyle like exercise and nutrition, and also teaching a bit of positive psych or gratitude. And so cognitive behavioral therapy really uses a wide variety of approaches. That being said, we're going to move into exactly what cognitive behavioral therapy is just in of itself. Cognitive behavioral therapy is largely addressing our automatic thoughts and behaviors. This really circles back to two prominent figures, Aaron Beck and Albert Ellis, and they were really talking about rational emotive therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, which started off seemingly different, but then merged together in a lot of their principles of both rational, rational emotive therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy are used together today. In both, what we're really doing is analyzing a person's negative appraisals, attributions, and assumptions that they make about the world and helping them to identify where some of that's not logical and in fact could be quite dysfunctional. So we talked a lot about appraisals, assumptions, and attributions already this semester in social psych and in health psych. And so it's really bringing that forward into more of a clinical setting. And so it's helping them to question and reflect and really to adjust their thinking through cognitive restructuring. This is different than what we talked about with psychoanalytic or client-centered. Client-centered, there would be no questioning or restructuring or addressing your logical problems. It wouldn't be calling that stuff out. And with psychoanalytic, it might be saying, you think about this because of this, but they don't really tell you where you went wrong per se. Versus cognitive behavioral therapists are not afraid to tell you where your thinking is problematic. And it's often combined with the behavioral approach because it comes with lots of homework. Not only do you have to change your thinking, but they encourage you to have conversations about things that might be a problem or do some work over the weekend or practice reflection journals. So not just about talking and listening, there's actual behaviors in it as well. Now, when we think about this, it's important to understand some of the, some of the big principles here is that it's understood that our thoughts, our behaviors, and emotions are all intertwined. And that a person who's experiencing depression might have more depressed emotions and might have depressed thoughts and more depressed behaviors. Or a person who is having very anxious thoughts is gonna feel more fearful and they're gonna have more avoidant behaviors. So you really have to treat the thoughts, the emotions, and the behaviors all together, which is really why this is a combined or more eclectic approach. We know that when somebody's feeling really depressed or negative about themselves, they also tend to be really negative about their future and about the world in general. They really tend to generalize. What happens in our cognitions is we learn certain approaches. We learn certain approaches to the world and we develop these pathways in our brain. We constantly strengthen some pathways and weaken others in our brain. And what happens is some of the pathways we just automatically strengthen all the time are problems. They're not the full picture. They're just one side of the picture. And so cognitive behavioral therapy is really about saying, no, you could take a different road. You don't have to go down that path. I think our textbook actually talks about the fact that you walk down a street and you keep falling into a hole until you learn you can walk down a different street. And so this is the idea that you can take a different path. Maybe not physically in life, but cognitively you can reframe things. And so some of the big paths that we can lead ourselves down that could be problematic are known as our cognitive distortions. Now cognitive distortions are a little bit different than perceptual biases or cognitive biases we may have talked about in other units. A cognitive distortion is really when the way you feel about something is not quite what it is in reality. And so these distortions, there's so many types, but we'll go through 10 of the types that tend to be the most common. One of them is filtering the positive. Filtering the positive is the idea that when you think about a situation or a past event or feedback on an essay, your brain filters out the positive and you only see the critical criticisms. This is the time you only remember the bad stuff. This is the idea when you think about something, you feel much more negative about it than it really was. There might be three bad comments and a hundred good comments and you only focus on the three bad comments. 
we have emotional reasoning. This is the idea when you're very, very upset about something, you might be more impulsive and less rational. And it seems logical to you, but it's not actually logical. So it's the idea of calming down before you make any rational choice. We have the third cognitive distortion of overgeneralizing. This is the idea that if one thing goes wrong, you think it'll always go wrong. This goes back to when we learned about locus of control and attributions and the more global attribution. The idea if you fail one test or get dumped one time, you'll think you'll forever be alone or you'll never do well at school. We have catastrophizing. This is when you assume that something that seems a little bit bad might become really bad. It's like you're running late for a meeting and you believe by showing up late for the meeting you'll lose your job. Or if somebody hung up and they got disconnected on a video chat, you assume they hung up because they're mad at you and they never want to talk to you again. So you're catastrophizing and jumping to the absolute worst conclusion. We also have polarized thinking. This is the idea that you think it has to be extreme opposites or a binary. This is the idea you say, if you're not with me, you're against me. If it's not this, it's the opposite. When really, in most situations in life, there's a lot of nuance. There's also the should thinking. We learned about this in, in health psych, we learned about the perfectionists. This is the idea they feel that they have to do things, they should do this. And what we find is in therapy, somebody says, well, I have to do this, I should do this. And the cognitive behavioral therapist will point out, well, do you really have to do this? Who's telling you you have to do this? Why do you feel you have to do this? Uh, and calling them out on it. There's the personalization. This is a really, really internalizing locus of control or attribution. This is the idea that blaming themselves for things that had nothing to do with them, blaming themselves for the pandemic, blaming themselves for the economy, blaming themselves for other people's struggles. They're personalizing everything and taking on more responsibility than what's theirs. We also have the opposite, externalizing and blaming when it's not rational. It's the idea that when you're frustrated at how the test is going, you absolutely dislike your teacher, even though it was a fair test. Or it's the idea when you get fired from a job, you blame a politician or you blame someone else um, because it's hard for you to look at it logically and rationally. There's also the fairness fallacy. This one's a little bit harder to understand, but this is the idea that you believe if you do something right, others will do something right too. This is the idea that I've put so much work into this relationship, they owe me at least that. Psychologists will say, do they owe you at least that? Did you have a conversation about that? Did you sign a contract saying they would owe you that? No, you just implied that and you hope that there's a social contract, but it's totally unspoken. They don't owe you at least that. Or if I've done all this, they should do this. Well, have you told them they should do this? Have you assertively communicated that with them? If you haven't, they're, they're free to do what they want. And then the last one is sort of similar, but instead of owing it from another person, they believe in karma or heaven's reward. And it's the idea, if I've been a good person, I've done this, I should be ahead on life. Well, what makes you think the world's fair? We don't have evidence to suggest the world's fair. In fact, quite the opposite. Why do you think you deserve this? So some of these cognitive distortions have to be about beating yourself down too much or beating other people down too much or having just higher expectations than what reality can offer. And adjusting that can really help us to lower some of our anxiety and feel more comfortable with what's going on in our life. However, CBT and cognitive behavioral therapy has been criticized for a number of reasons. It's still the most common type in Canada, but if you look at it, there's a lot of cognitive restructuring and invalidating one's feelings. And so this invalidation or telling someone to change their problematic thinking can be a problem. There's a lot of times where what someone's going through, it might be a distortion, but it's real to them. Or if a person is catastrophizing and they really feel like the catastrophe could happen, persuading them otherwise seems to be a fool's errand. And so this has been a bit challenged in more recent decades. One approach that has really responded to that shortcoming of cognitive behavioral therapy is DBT or dialectical behavior therapy. Dialectical behavior therapy became really popular by Marsha Lindman. And this is the idea that we have to balance changing our cognitions with accepting our cognitions. There's some cognitions that if we are confronted on, we can change. We can realize we're blowing some things out of proportion. But there's other things that we're not gonna be able to change. We always feel a high level of emotional reaction to those things. Dr. Lindman believed that some people are just more emotionally impulsive and more emotionally reactive and their highs are higher, their lows are lower. And this is really good therapy used for people with borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder is associated with really, really intense emotional reactions to things that are very real to the person. And telling them they just shouldn't react doesn't seem very helpful. 
So rather, this is about uh, not invalidating one's feelings, but focusing on those really intense emotions they feel. When they can change their thoughts, change them. But when they can't, focus on the thoughts and how the emotions associated with those thoughts make you feel and understand that even though you feel those really intense things, your distress can be managed. Your thoughts are just thoughts. They are powerful, they are valid, but they're just thoughts and you don't have to follow them. You don't have to hurt yourself or take lots of substances or do something really impulsive. You can say, okay, brain, I hear you. That's a really intense thought. Thanks for letting me know. I'm going to move on now. This has often been combined with mindfulness. CBT has responded and has started to incorporate a lot more mindfulness in response to this criticism, but DBT and CBT both use mindfulness. And this is the idea of trying to ground the person, stay in the present, talk about things you can feel, you can hear, you can see, you can smell, so they get out of their thoughts that are very captivating. And it's the idea that when they're feeling this really intense emotional distress, teaching them adaptive behaviors, teaching them relaxation therapy or how to communicate with others and say, I need help. I'm feeling very distressed right now. And so this is the really good skill set that we found has made a huge breakthrough with treating a lot of personality disorders.